Our next speaker is going to speak with us a little bit about a global workforce and what that means. So I am excited to have Philip Mowry. He has had significant executive leadership experiences in government, for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, and also in academia. Phillips spent his first 11 years of his career engaged in the practice of law. In those years, he served as the Assistant Attorney General for Ohio, and then later as an active duty judge advocate in the U.S. Air Force, reaching the rank of Major. <laughs> Following his military service, Philip entered the corporate world and worked for Reynolds and & Reynolds and then LexisNexis, I think I said that right. While at these global companies, he managed several large operational groups, was heavily involved in um, corporate strategy and innovation, and led a new business startup. That's always good to hear. Philip also started in his own company during the recent recession, involved in the repurposing of human capital, and has served as an executive vice president and chief operating officer for a multi-site technology incubator. Philip joined Welldyne in 2010 and serves as its vice president over human resources and also as its chief legal officer. Philip has a BA from uh, Earlham College and a law degree from the University of Dayton law of, uh, School of Law. He is a graduate of the United States Air Force Command and Staff College and has completed executive programs at the University of Michigan School of Business and also the University of Dayton School of Business. Philip is licensed to practice law in Ohio and is authorized as, to serve as a corporate counsel in Florida and Colorado. I am proud to say that Weldine is a, an academy partner for us in the community of Fort Meade, and he is very excited to be a part of Polk Academies. Please welcome Philip. Thank you. I'm going to be far less entertaining than our last speaker, I promise. Just look at my picture on the <laughs> flyer. No smiling. That's 10 years in the military. Um, but uh, I, I, I just want to say real quick before we get started how unbelievably quickly uh, John Small sucked me and my company into the academy process. Um, I came down here three and a half years ago from Ohio and um, didn't even have any clue about this system and so stuck the children in, in, in the private school. And then, as my last one was heading up to senior year, I met John, and within, I don't know, two months, I had toured academies, and I just kept shaking my head. I said, man, oh man, oh man, I wish I would have known about this. And we just became, as a company, really excited about what, what this all means for our future workforce and uh, quality of life for our employees. And uh, so, before you know it, uh, we get uh, involved with starting a Welldyne Academy in Fort Meade uh, for pharmacy technology. So, um, it, it, this all happened in a matter of months. So, what a tremendous leader we have in the community uh, in John, and I know that... Um, Yeah, and it doesn't hurt that we're both Pennsylvania boys, the same age, and we love the Steelers. So other than that, <laughs> we have nothing in common. Um, You're going to rape the over here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I, it gets worse. I'm a, I'm a diehard Penn State guy, too. We've got our, we've got our issues there, too. Um, <laughs> All right, so I, uh, hopefully I can get through this as quickly as I can so that if there are any questions, uh, we can do that, and otherwise I can hand it off to the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the program. Um, I represent the customer base. We are the customer for what you all are trying to produce in the school system and the academy system. Uh, we are that interested party. And we have our own perspective on what you're doing and what we need. And that's what I kind of want to talk to you about this morning or this afternoon. Um, so I've been doing this, hiring people and coaching and mentoring and all that kind of stuff for a while in all different fields from the military to the government to corporate world and not for profit. So my perspective and our perspective come from not just one silo in the community, but from a variety of different places. And I think I've had to take this concept and what the industry wants and try to take all these different ideas and put them into one presentation. I think each one of the things that I want to talk about is subject for at least a half an hour conversation. Uh, so I'll do my best. Um, 
There are some constants in what we are looking for that have always been and will always be, but there are also some very, very fundamental things that have changed in what employers want and need um, from when a lot of us learned the rules. I'll be 50 in November, and when I started, when I was a kid, when I was in school, um, I was presented the rules. And as a kid, and all of you that are my age or older were presented with these same rules. And we never questioned the rules. These were the rules. Okay, what do I have to do to have success in life, to be able to feed my family and have a career and, and so on and so forth? The rules were very simple. You get an education, try to get a college education if you can, get with a company or a union or the government, keep your nose clean, be loyal, show up to work on time, and you're going to stay there probably for your whole career. No facial hair for the guys, ties, gray suit, That's, that was the drill. And I didn't question that, I just accepted that. And somewhere, a little while ago, all this blew up on me. Uh, and a lot of stuff has changed, and I've been looking at all this from a change perspective, and it is somewhat disturbing for people my age and older, but my three daughters, for them, these are the rules. I have a daughter, and I'll talk about my soon-to-be son-in-law. I'm heading to Ohio next Saturday to walk her down the aisle, and she's got a great, great guy. He's a technology guy, so I'm happy about that. Um, but she's had, she graduated last year. She's had two jobs. And when they go to Seattle for his job after the wedding, I guarantee you she'll have a job in a matter of weeks because she knows this stuff. And that's normal. For anybody else, my parents in particular, my, what's wrong with her? She went to college. How come she can't keep a job? Those are the new rules. You have to be prepared to engage the world as it is. And the kids today are growing up with technology and these new rules. And, and for them, it just is. So what, what, what is? That's what I want to talk about. Well, here's some of the things that we grew up with, they grew up with, and will never change. We as employers want somebody with a positive attitude, right? I mean, that's always been and always will be. Work ethic, right? If I'm going to pay somebody to do something for me, I want them to do it honestly and work hard at it. That's always been and that will always be. Respect. We all as individual creatures want respect and are expected to give respect. And while things are more casual now, I would be in a tie if I were here 20 years ago, uh, respect is still an important part of any human interaction. Court awareness. You gotta have a head on a swivel, whether you're in a football game or whether you're in a dodgeball game or whether you're climbing the corporate ladder, you have to have awareness of what's going on around you. That has always been and will always be. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? That is the platform for everything. And from the advent of writing, uh, and certainly in the beginning of time, we were able to count on our fingers, that has always been important and always will be. And communication. The ability to communicate with your boss, with your customers, with your staff, uh, to be understood, to motivate, to do so clearly and with, with some kind of articulation. That kind of stuff has always been important and always will be important. But some of the new rules, you know, I was talking about the job expectations for dress for men when I started the IBM look. When I came out of the military, I had been in 10 years. I went in 89, came out in 99. The world had changed on me. So first thing I did was I went to uh, Joseph A. Bank or the men's store, one kind, and I bought for me, which was an unbelievable amount of money, $500 worth of suits. And I show up at my first corporate job, and I'm dressed. There, nobody's there wearing a tie. Nobody has a jacket. I'm there in a suit. I look like a complete idiot. And I, you know, the world had changed on me. Well, not only is it no no ties, guys. But you can have a neck tattoo, and nobody's going to blink twice at that. Things have changed. So the, there's a non-uniformity in the workplace that is a different thing. Incremental career progression, paying your dues. That's the way it used to be, right? You know, shut up and color. You know, youngster, wipe your nose, and we'll, we'll tell you what, when you can do something. Today, my young attorneys want to want to sit in my office and do my job and question why they can't make policy decisions and all that stuff. I mean, that's just the way it is. That paying your dues, if you're smart enough and you have self-confidence enough, you're going to want to play with the big boys quickly. 
longevity, 40-year careers. I mean, very, very rare today that anybody is anywhere for any amount of time. Loyalty. And that's a difficult thing in the, work, in the workforce. I mean, there always has to be loyalty. You have to believe your boss is looking out for you or you're, you're not going to be there long. But I, what I mean by loyalty is that expectation that um, if I do a good job, a reasonably good job, the company will be there and I will be there when it comes time for me to retire. And that's no longer the case. You've heard these presenters talk about, um, you know, the, the flattening of the world and, and so on and so forth. We call this the commoditization of labor. Um, you know, you can, when I was in Dayton the first time at law school, there were guys that hadn't graduated and listened to me. I talk guys. That's also part of my generation. I mean, <laughs> men and women. I mean, employees. Forgive me. I've got three daughters and I get beat up about this all the time. But there were, there were, un, there were people that didn't graduate graduated from high school that were making $100,000 a year at General Motors. Dayton was General Motors town. The only way that that's possible is if there are restrictions on labor. With the world opening up as it is now, there are the, no more restrictions. In fact, not only are there no more restrictions as to labor, there are very few restrictions on where the company can be. So not only are we not going to hire you in Dayton at $100,000 a year, we may not even be in Dayton. All of that has changed the psychology of the workplace, both from an employer perspective and an employee perspective. Organizational life cycles. Again, you know, when I started, I thought that wherever I would go to work would be there well past when I was done. But that's not the case anymore. Companies are starting and shutting down faster and faster and faster for all kinds of reasons. One of them is the product lifestyle, a life cycle. Products are coming into favor and falling out of favor. Com uh, technology uh, products are coming in and becoming obsolete faster and faster and faster. And there are companies that can't adapt to change or that you know, they, they want to make quick money. I make this product, I know it's going to go out of favor and then I'm gone. But you know, there used to be people, craftsmen, that used to work on things for their whole life. They got better and better and better and they trained the next generation. Uh, a lot of that is changing. And then the global companies, global workforce, global markets, and diversity. Now, this is not an uncommon thing today. A young German female manager in a Canadian company leading Pakistani engineers working in Polk County, Florida, targeting Chinese customers. <laughs> if you would have said that when I started, you, people would have said, you know, you got two heads. But that's, that is what's going on. I mean, you cannot assume that your coworker is even a citizen today. Nothing wrong with that. It's just a new reality. Again, totally changed. My kids are my kids get it. It's still, for me, kind of an interesting phenomena. So what's driving, what has been driving these changes? Well, global connectivity and migration, um, companies, products, labor, regulatory and legal risk. Um, even though I, you know, it's job security for me and, and one side of the house that I'm working on, it, it, is, it is rather frustrating on another side of the house. And um, Coming from Dayton, I got to tell you two stories about Dayton. Um, two great business stories. One of them is a sales story. So I was told this by somebody from a company called Standard Register that's still, it's one of the few companies headquarters still in Dayton, Ohio. And the head, the head sales guy said, you know, if you're ever in a sales meeting and, and you know, you're not getting the response you need and people are just telling you it can't be done or whatever, just tell them this story. So in you know, Dayton, Ohio, home of the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers took their first airplane down to Maryland to the Army to try to sell it to the Army as a way to, for their intelligence and communication. So they put an un, unassuming young lieutenant in the cockpit with one of the Wright brothers, took it up, they crashed and they killed the lieutenant. And they made the sale. So the lesson is, I don't want to hear your whining, the Wright brothers killed their customer and still got the sale. That's a pretty cool story. The other one, the other one is, uh, more serious is that, well, that was serious for the lieutenant, but <laughs> is that they would never have, there would be no Wright brothers known to the world where there are the regulations and the taxes that exist today in Ohio. 
there's no way that they would have been allowed to or they could have afforded to or they would have taken the risk to do what they did. So it just is, right? My kids grow up. This is the way these students are going to see the world. So they have to understand this. And we as employers need to understand the, the IQ of the people we're hiring so that we're not going to put ourselves in unnecessary regulatory or legal risk. Technology. Technology, I mean, I think that's the obvious one. Things are changing all the time, and everything depends on technology now. Um, demographic changes, we've talked a little bit about that. You know, the, the graying of the workforce to some extent, the, the, uh, the movement of the, the migration around the country and around the world, and then social evolution. Who's actually in the workforce and why? So perhaps the key issues in today's work environment are the speed of change and the complexity of everything. Right, speed of change, you just look at your cell phone. My kids get so ticked off that we can't, we, you know, we've got a plan. We're not going to get you that new thing until we're the end of the plan. I'm sorry. Uh, that's amazing. And complexity. You look at the diversity of ethnicity and gender and religious beliefs in the workforce. Um, General Electric gets most of his revenue out. The quintessential American company gets most of his revenue outside the United States. Call centers for American products have been in India for a long time. And in your world, adult education and traditionally liberal arts or, or traditionally younger student-oriented institutions as a matter of survival, right? Things are complex. It's not just, okay, we need to build some more dorms for, you know, 18 to 21-year-olds. We got How are we going to deal with the 55-year-old unemployed person and how are we going to service them? And it's a whole different model. So the competency there to deal with that is the ability to survive and thrive in a high-speed, high-change, complex world. And this is, you know, uh, it's everywhere. And this is a business advisor, a guy that's known around the world for helping businesses. And basically, it's adapt or die. Those who take advantage of external change will thrive because external change is more frequent, more volatile, and more uncertain than ever. That is the key competency that I'm looking for in an employee. When it's all said and done, I need somebody that can deal with change and can help manage change and is comfortable with change and isn't freaked out by change. So let's deconstruct that. What's involved with that? Um, knowledge. Obviously, if you don't have anything inside your head, then you're not going to be much help to me. Um, you want to amass relevant and deployable capital, right? <laughs> but it used to be you get a high school diploma and you had enough stuff in your head that you could be fine for me. And then it used to be you can get a degree and an advanced degree and you had enough stuff in your head and that's not the case anymore. You have to have intellectual curiosity so that you are constantly amassing, filtering, ordering, purging, refreshing information in your head all the time. And you have to have an appreciation for that. It's not enough to be able to do the processing. You have to have an understanding of why it's important. And this is, the, you know, I've heard this from educators a long time, and you don't need to be told this, but self-directed lifetime learning, right? You are responsible for the stuff in your head, not, not the head of the school system. And of course, you need to be technologically astute. And for for my generation and older, it's a pain in the butt to have to, you know, I'm just loading a new uh, legal data management system into our thing. And so I've been, been trained this week on I have to relearn the whole thing all over again. Forgive me. But uh, I would just prefer to write a memo and have my paralegal type it up. But that doesn't, that's not the case anymore. Um, innovation. And anybody that knows me knows that that's what it's all about right there, innovation. Adopting an engagement plan, being entrepreneurial, right? What does that mean? And when I talk about entrepreneurship, I do not talk about starting a business. That's too narrow of a definition for entrepreneurship. I'm talking about someone that is equipped to constantly survey the landscape, wherever that might be, for opportunity. And then to take advantage of that opportunity. That's what I want in an employee, an intrapreneur. Leadership. That's how you're going to execute all this, right? You need to be culturally astute. Why? Because leadership is, at the end of the day, about motivating people to do things. And when everybody looked like me, then you only needed to know one thing. 
but not everybody looks like me. In fact, less and less people look like me, right? So as a leader with my people, I have 50% or more women in my workforce now. Um, I have uh, non-English as a primary language people. So I have to really take time to understand who these people are individually, right? Treat everybody the same, but understand that if you're a good leader, you got to know what makes people tick. And if you don't have any knowledge of culture or other types of people, you're going to fail there. And then understand leadership as a, as a discipline, right? The art and science of getting things done, influencing other people. I think one of the one of the great gifts I got from the military, other than the VA benefit, I didn't have any money when I left, but um, I was taught about leadership. The United States military trains leaders better than anywhere else, and, and, and people you can tell people that have been in the military um, by how effective they are, generally speaking, no matter whether they're a four-year enlisted person or a 30-year colonel or general, they are taught to appreciate and are expected to execute leadership in its formal kind of way. What does it mean? How do you use it? When do you use it? What are the expectations for you? Leadership, you don't put it on and take it off. It's 24-7, on and on and on. That has to be ingrained in people for success at any level because leadership, I'm not talking about just formal leadership, I'm the boss of somebody. You know, it used to be just like entrepreneurship that it was a choice. Uh, I don't want to be an entrepreneur, I don't have it within me. We'll talk about that in a little bit, it isn't a choice anymore. But neither is leadership. I was stationed for three years in Minot, North Dakota and I saw north of 70 below zero. Now that's wind chill, but your body dies at the wind chill number, not, at the, not the actual number. <laughs> So that's pretty dangerous cold. You're outside for a few seconds, your skin's freezing and you're, you're going down. Every year, there are people that, you know, they have gates on the communities when it gets that cold that they don't let people out because, you know, it's, it's death. And there are people, families, that their car breaks down. Uh, you know, mom's coming back from the aunt and she's halfway to the, where they live. The car breaks down, there's nobody coming by and it's 50 below zero. I don't care whether she doesn't think of herself as a leader, she better be a leader in that particular circumstance. That is, keep her head, figure out a game plan, take care of those people she's charged with and making sure that they're okay. That's leadership. Every person will, will have face leadership challenges every day. It used to be, again, well, there are leadership types and non-leadership types. In the business world anyways, we expect all of our people to be leaders all the time. And then values. Not necessarily something that business people talk about, but I think it's a, it's a differentiator. You know, if I see somebody that has good core values, um, that's, that's good to other people, respects other people, they get a credibility in the workplace, they become leaders, and, and they, they have an easier time getting promoted. All right, so what makes Weldine competitive and who do I want to hire? I want to hire a liberally educated person. And what I mean by that is it's not just enough to do reading, writing, and arithmetic. We need to understand geography. We need to understand history. It, it is amazing to me the depth of knowledge of history that people that were not educated in the United States have, just uniformly when I meet them, whether I'm on vacation overseas or in my workplace or anywhere in the United States. They have an appreciation for history, and not just their own history. They know the American history better than anybody else, the, the Americans that they're around, and that's a lost thing, and it's important because it provides context. It provides context. So liberal education is important. STEM. You want to be STEM capable, and that is, you know, the universal language, there's only one, and that's mathematics, right? So everybody understands math. Think about it. It's the only language that everybody understands. So you got to know science. You not need to know technology. You need to know math. Um, there's just no way around it. Cultural sensitivity, we've been through that. Entrepreneurship, that's key. Values, I want a leader. These things comprise, comprise that. But it's not just Phil Mowry that's saying this. I pulled this, you know, when I started, uh, you know, getting my presentation together about 20 minutes ago. Uh, I just went and Googled, right? And this is what this is what companies are saying. All right, innovators, sense of ownership, bold thinkers, innovative spirit. We look for people with a passion for technology who are motivated, nimble, and work well in collaborative environments. Passion, creativity, initiative, intelligence, getting things done, attitude. It's ubiquitous. That's what, that's what we want. 
Um, and it's important that I think in one of these things it talks about across all functions, yeah, in blue, across our business. There are more non-tech specific people in most businesses, even technology businesses, than there are tech people, right? So I don't mean everybody has to become an engineer. But it's not okay anymore to say I'm not good at math or I'm not good at science. And I wasn't, that's why I went to law school. But, um, you know, it's, that's not okay, and my, my, my kids too. You, you have got to have competency in science and math and become comfortable with technology. The kids are motivated to be technologically savvy on their own most of the time. But math, if it's not made fun and practical, then girls still, I'm afraid to say, and guys like me, we're just going to check the box and get out of there. But, but now I'm having to do percentages and ratios and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, when we bring in interns, it, it's important to put them the skills in the context. I mean, you guys are the professional educators, and I'm hearing everything you're saying. It makes a lot of sense. But we've got to make them understand why it's important. But it's across everything. I'm an HR, and we do payroll, we do benefits analysis, and if I've got somebody that wants to help people but can't do math, they're not going to be good for me or the organization. So you got to know that stuff. All right, so you know, here I'm kind of leaving my area of expertise, but um, what do we need to provide our kids? Both at home and in school, we have to work on values. Um, again, I, I, I learned to be a professional in the United States military. And when I would walk into my boss's office after screwing something up, his only question was, what were you trying to do? And if I said I was trying to do the right, capital R, I was trying to do the right thing, I said, fine, just don't do it again. What would you learn from it? Right? I was taught a certain way of thinking, having certain workplace values, prioritizing other people and other things above myself. And that's what everybody wants. Integrity, hard work, concern for others, that's both something to learn at home and something that we have to reinforce or teach in school. Entrepreneurial skills, problem solving, that's the key to everything. Um, we were having a conversation over here a second ago, and I come from Ohio, where there are tens of thousands of unemployed scientists and engineers. So STEM is not the answer by itself. The question is, what do you do with that? What can you do with that? And if that's not taught, then you've got a whole bunch of engineers, if they're not provided a problem to solve, they're lost, right? So the entrepreneurial overlay on top of that knowledge is, now that I got this stuff, what problem can I solve? And that is a, a mindset. That's a mindset that has to pervade everything. You know, my girls are graduating and heading into the workforce, and I got no worries, right? From the time they were little, I'd ask them the question, you're sitting in an interview, and the guy says, or the woman says, what can you do for me? What's the answer? What's the right answer? Most people will say, look at all this stuff. I taught my girls to say, what do you need? Right? Because then that opens up the whole playing field, and if they're entrepreneurial and self-confident, he'll tell her exactly what he wants. And they can answer the next, way, the next time just building that answer to that particular answer. That's being an entrepreneur. It has nothing to do with building a business, but it's being entrepreneurial in life. Liberal education, I got into that again. You know, the, the, um, you know, the mantra of the liberal education colleges are life's problems are complex. And in order to engage with them, you, or engage them, you've got to have a complex set of perspectives. I mean, I just, you've got to have that. STEM, home and school, cultural sensitivity, home and school. So, you know, here's that word alignment again. But maybe it's time to have a, a parent academy where, you know, it is the public, right? It's public money, 
And the teachers, I feel so sorry for sometimes in these tough situations where they're getting unequipped, uninterested, uninspired, unreinforced people. Uh, maybe we have some kind of formal education process and system where we reinforce the messages that the school system is trying to implement uh, with parents. So there's your next academy. Thanks, you got it. Um, how am I doing? All right, so from employer perspective, the bottom line, we, are, we need boundaryless in every respect, right? In, in understanding and sensitivity and in, in, in education and skills. Uh, confident and curious people. Uh, job ready. We don't have the time. We do not have the time because for us too everything is more complex and speeding up. We don't have the time to mentor and, and do the things that if, you know, if I was going to, if I'm in the watchmaking business a hundred years ago, well, okay, I get my apprentice and we, you know, I have time for that. Don't have time for that anymore. Um, I hired a payroll clerk with a college education. She couldn't put three sentences together. Three sentences. She could, I mean, after constant coaching, was incapable of, of leveraging proper grammar. What am I going to do with that? I don't. I can't teach her to basic English. It was unbelievable. So we don't have time for that. Um, so major deficiencies. Any of these uh, are not only going to prejudice the employee, the potential employee. They put me at risk, right? Because. We need a workforce that believes from an HR perspective that the company is at least administering the benefits right and they're not going to miss their paycheck and, and you know everything behind the scenes is operating properly. And if they're getting an email from the payroll clerk that they could barely understand, what level of confidence are they going to have in the leadership of the company, let alone payroll? That's a problem. That's a problem. All right, so let me brag on my soon-to-be son-in-law here. Um, and I was just, I, I was, CNN, I'm going to do it. When John was talking, I lost interest. <laughs> so. You too. You too? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out checking the market. And uh, so I'll talk to you about his experience in nailing this job. And, and that the um, requirements for even a tech guy, he's a, he's a software developer, right? He's a computer scientist. That was his, his, his degree. They put him through the ringer up in Seattle, right? Yeah, okay, can he develop software? But they forced him to interview with departments that weren't, tech and weren't software departments. All right, can he think outside the box, using that tired phrase? Then they threw at him personnel issues and other things that, you know, he's a, he's a, sits in the basement at his computer. That's how he, I mean, so, you know, solve, a, let me see if you can solve a people problem, right? Can he communicate? They, they, they paneled, interviewed him with people that weren't, weren't technologists. And can he thrive in a diverse environment? Can you imagine a kid coming from Dayton, Ohio, three, four generations there going to Seattle? Well, uh, he's loving it and did great and, and passed the test, thank God. And um, the rewards are unbelievable. I had, I was blown away. I was almost jealous. I mean, what he's getting as a 23-year-old, one year out of college, is mind-boggling. Now, it's a lot more expensive up there. Gotcha. Thank you. It's a lot more expensive out there. But what he's getting paid is, is just shouldn't be. It should be illegal. Under my rules from the old days, <laughs> that's what the CEO should make. But that's what the market is asking for. And if your kids want that, and who wouldn't want that, then they got to be able to do this. So I was out on CNN Money uh, looking at some articles and interview questions. These are just a few of the tough interview questions job seekers were asked by interviewers in the past year. Okay, so imagine you're a technologist. How would you build an engine from scratch? You think you'd be prepared for that when you're interviewing? 18, 21 years old? Can you estimate the revenue from the 2012 Olympic ticket sales? Okay, that's not, hey look, I, I, inter I uh, interned over at the museum last summer. How many people are watching YouTube in any given hour? Now, he would have the math to, to be able to put the numbers together, but how does he get to the numbers? Well, he has to have some awareness of what's going on in society and on and on, think on his feet and on and on and on. 
even the, the, the technology people want liberally educated employees. They, they value it, they put their, their money where their mouth is, and so we disregard history and English and so, social sciences at our peril. All right, so where am I here? All right, so here, here it is. The world has changed to me fundamentally in, in two ways. It's no longer about what you do know now, but it's about what you can know now. Forward learning skills. The ability, and that comes from you know, having the experience in school, but it also comes from the interest, understanding and appreciating why lifetime learning is important. And if you don't have that, you're going to be a dinosaur. And the second, we're going back to the future. And this is what I wish I could have spent the whole time on. But a couple quick points. If our great grandparents were plopped down into this economy of today and into this, this country of today, they would have felt like they've died and gone to heaven from an economic perspective, right? In their day, there was no, no social security, there was no Medicare, there was no safety nets, and so on and so forth. They had to, with the sweat of their own brow and the work of their own hands, figure it out. Because if they didn't, they, they wouldn't live. So, you know, my ancestors were sharpening scissors in the streets of New York City when they came off the boat and they were selling apples on the corner. Everybody was an entrepreneur. And, and my proposition is that after this recession, we've kind of started heading back in that. That World War II to 1980, where there was security, two and a half generations were raised with the expectation that if they went to work and were loyal, that they could stay there. That's gone. We're now having to be entrepreneurial to survive, but in a much, much more stable, better world than our great-grandparents. But it wasn't a choice for them, and my proposition is for our kids today, they better understand that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship is not a choice for them. And then I like to talk uh, history or, 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 or give analogies, right? Lions and gazelles. Since World War II, all the colonels and generals came back from World War II, brought with them military management techniques and became CEOs of all the companies, right? Or school board superintendents. And they brought with them loyalty, take care of the troops, all the things that our grandparents had, we had, uh, my parents had, and half of my life was. And then that all blew up. So I say, we're all gazelles on the African savanna, and we're sitting under a shade tree for two and a half generations. Life is good. There's no lions. Guess what? All of a sudden, the lions come over the hill, and we're freaking out. Somebody's got to give me a job. Somebody's got to fix the economy. Somebody's got to give me more skills. Somebody's got to... And my thing is, get up and start running. And guess what? You're a gazelle. God or evolution or whatever your belief system is created you to outrun the lions. And you ask anybody in here that's an, truly an entrepreneur and depending completely on themselves, there is no greater satisfaction than being able to take care of yourself. And we were all built for that. Now, we're not all going to be Bill Gates. But maybe we'll have, an, uh, we'll have an apple stand. But the point is, I believe we were designed to take care of ourselves, not run the lines, each and every one of us, and not sit in a cube and have a boss tell us what to do. So if we can get our kids inculcated with that understanding that they are responsible for their own success and they are responsible for their life and that STEM or typing or whatever skills, there's no guarantee except their own work ethic and their own attitude, their own values and their own brain. That's the secret to success. There's a premium on entrepreneurship. It's not a choice, and I've talked about that before. Entrepreneurship is the ability to scan the horizon, see opportunity, problems to be solved for the entrepreneur, believing that you have what it takes to solve that problem, and then going about solving that problem. And that's where innovation comes in. Innovation is that methodology for solving these tough problems. I did it. All right. If, if you'll allow it. Any questions? Um, you're with Wellline, and I don't know if everybody knows what Wellline does. And Wellline is a national leader in wellness and health care. Uh, 
We are uh, providers of the pharmacy benefit when you get your insurance card for the pharmacy, either mail order or you go to CVS or whatever. Well, we have a Welldyne card. And what we do is we cut out the Blue Cross's insurance piece. Traditionally, your, your stuff comes with the benefit for pharmacy and doctor and visual and whatever, but also a huge chunk of insurance premium that they know they'll never have to give the company, and so that's a lot of spend. And private companies for the last 25 years have said, and school districts and governmental organizations have said, why pay this upside insurance, why not self-insure, save the money, and just buy the benefit? But you couldn't do that. So companies like Welldyne started in the medical, in the pharmacy, in the vision, in the dental by saying, we can provide you the same network that these big insurance companies provide. We have 60,000 pharmacies across the country just like they do with a Welldyne card, and we'll just charge you for managing the transactions and not for the upside. But we also have mail order pharmacy and a lot of other cool little innovative businesses. My boss, Damian Lamondola, is a serial entrepreneur and he's a great guy to work with, so, all right, I, I've, all right, good, all right, thank you. Thank you so much.